Hey everyone, it's Ross, and uh, I got a nice little smile on my face today because we're finally going to be rooting our fig cuttings. We are officially beginning uh, this process here because we, we do have about six months of, uh, of frost-free growing days where we can grow outside, but then we have six months of nothing. So I can't really think of a better way to alleviate the symptoms of missing your garden, missing your orchard, than starting fig cuttings indoors, um, or starting any cutting for that matter. What I want to do for you guys today in this video is really give you guys a big rundown, a lot of information on rooting these fig cuttings. So be patient with me. Um, I promise you at the end of this video, you're going to have very few questions. I'm going to cover the very common questions and even questions you probably haven't even thought of. Um, we're also going to be not just rooting fig cuttings like you see here that I have in these bags, but also I'm going to start some mulberry cuttings. This is a Morris Nigra mulberry that I would like to, to propagate. Um, and if I were going to do, let's say, pomegranates or any other fruit tree as an example, this is the method of how I would root them. Um, I wouldn't change the method one little bit. The only difference with something like a mulberry or let's say you wanted to root some, some stone fruits or apples or pears, uh, maybe you wanted to do this, like the mulberries, like I said, or maybe a persimmon or, or something, that isn't very easily rooted, you just are gonna wanna use some rooting hormone. Um, and even then you may not have success. Uh, some things are just much more difficult to root than others. I, I do find there are some species of mulberry that are very easy. There's a, figs are very easy. And also pomegranates are very easy. Uh, there's also probably some, some fruits like like currants and gooseberries and josta berries, maybe even hascap. Uh, you could probably do grapevines pretty easily. Um, you're gonna need some rooting hormone. You probably would, you can, you can even probably do some blueberries if you really know what you're doing with this method. Um, so while this video here is specific to figs, I don't wanna discourage anybody from trying this um, with any other species of, of fruit tree um, or fruiting plant. It's also um, kind of taken me a little bit here to get this video and this whole process going. We're now the day after Christmas. Um, so we're almost into January and what that means for me anyway is I have about four months of the dormant season left. Um, at least four months of until our last frost. And you don't want to move these fig trees outside until a frost is completely gone. There's no chance of a frost. Um, we do want to harden them off for about two weeks, but what I would suggest is that, because I get this question quite a bit, is that you want to give them about three months. I think three months in this indoor environment would be my personal minimum um, and my recommendation for satisfactory sized trees before you move them outside. Of course, a lot of you guys are probably gonna have no choice. Maybe some of you guys are getting into this a little bit late in the game. Um, so you just gotta do what you gotta do. But I would say three months is pretty reasonable for most of us. You may have some pretty awesome lights. You may have the perfect environment. You may be really great at this. And this process may only take you two months, uh, maybe a month and a half. Um, I doubt anyone can do this in a month. Uh, what you're really hoping for, what you really want at the end of this process is that you want a fig tree with hardened roots and hardened wood. We want the wood to be somewhat hardened because when we move these trees outside and we, we really shock them this way, if they're hardened up with their roots 
and then also the new growth that came out that's a really good sign that we have a very strong tree um, if you have really flimsy weak green growth that's a good sign that the roots are not hardened up um, the only real way you'll ever know though is if you look at the roots yourself you take it out of the pot and look at it but ideally in three months we should have a fully rooted out fig tree we're close to it in this one gallon size pot this is the size pots that I'm using and we did talk about I think two days ago a video that we did um, mentioning the pots talking about what kind of pots I'm using why I'm using these specific pots we talked about fabric pots versus plastic pots we talked about the soil why I've selected the soil what soil I'm using it's very simply just uh, heavily compost based 50% compost 50% pine bark it drains very well but it also has good organic material with some good nutrients in it we talked about the debate between uh, there's a pretty good debate out there talking about a soilless uh, a soilless potting mix versus using a compost based potting mix and a lot of people like to use soilless mixes things like peat moss and perlite vermiculite maybe even some rice holes um, those are pretty popular like pro mix is made out of peat moss and perlite um, and that's a great way of doing it um, I can't disagree with it I just prefer this this is what I've been doing it works out really well I will say that the debate between using a soilless mixture pretty much the whole idea behind that is that because there's no soil there's very little activity in the soil that's then trying to rot the cutting because when you take a, a cutting here and you stick this into soil like any branch it starts to rot right if you were to put a branch on the ground the microbes and the natural processes of, of what is in the soil really starts to rot this and starts to break it down so people's argument is that uh, if you use a soilless mixture that doesn't happen uh, personally I think it builds a stronger tree by putting it into a um, a material such as compost that's living that has these microbes in it the cutting has natural defenses that are fighting against these microbes this cutting wants to live and it's up to the grower to help this cutting along um, so by getting a cutting in the soil that has to fight against the elements has to withstand poor conditions that maybe it's stressed out a little bit that's going to build a, a stronger and uh, healthier tree in the long run so personally I like to do this with compost it could go either way it doesn't really matter um, I will tell you that using peat moss it can be a bad idea because it's hydrophobic meaning it repels water so if it's dry which can happen very frequently in a dry environment such as this and it's also very warm in my grow closet um, you will get some dry peat moss especially on the surface and then it's very difficult to get that peat moss wet again and you struggle you struggle with the right amount of moisture in the soil because I'm ending up having to overwater to get that peat moss wet again and therefore I have very wet peat moss and therefore I end up rotting my cutting so this whole process uh, really revolves around the appropriate soil moisture we want a moisture content that's not wet that's not dry but moist moist is the appropriate term uh, when we squeeze it we should get a little bit of drop of one little drop out of the soil that's the appropriate level of moisture that's the appropriate level of moisture for pretty much growing anything that's the appropriate level of moisture that should be in your compost pile 
that should be in your pots, that should be in the ground. So it only makes sense that that is the appropriate level of moisture in our rooting process. Um, so that's really key. And I, I wouldn't really, um, I'd be leading you guys astray if I didn't talk about the soil here, even though we talked about it two days ago. We've also talked about this entire process. We've pretty much labeled this out video by video, every single step of the way of the rooting process, start to finish last year. We did this last winter time. I have a playlist that you guys can go and look at. Just check out the playlist. It's rooting fig cuttings. You'll see it there. The other really important thing that you guys need to know about um, is the temperature. And a lot of you guys overlook the temperature. It's a, it's a shame. It really is because the temperature is so important. Biologically, metabolically, this will not root if you do not have the right temperature. Figs will grow roots at about 50 degrees, but that's the soil temperature we're talking about here. But I'll tell you what, at 50 degrees, they don't really do a whole lot at 50 degrees. About 60 degrees, it goes higher. The, the metabolisms of these trees go even higher. At 70 degrees, they go significantly higher. It's a pretty big jump from 60 to 70 degrees. Then when we go from 70 to 80 degrees, it's actually pretty nuts. Um, I think 78 degrees is probably the most optimal soil temperature for rooting, for root growth of figs. You need to know whatever it is, whatever the species is of, of fruiting plant or whatever it is, whatever the plant is, you need to know the optimum temperature of that plant. It's not easy to find that out. Uh, fortunately, you, there are some studies out there that exist on figs and they've mentioned this in their studies, what I just mentioned to you. But even anecdotally, I can tell you guys that about 70 to, 75 to 80 degrees is really gonna be where your most highest success is. And most of us in the wintertime don't have our houses, our indoor rooting environments warm enough because it's cold outside and a lot of us are not going to be willing to spend tons of money to pay for our, our heating bill. Um, so what I would suggest, these lights really help. These lights produce an immense amount of heat. Uh, you can also get yourself some heating mats that will also produce some bottom heat. Um, another thing I do is that behind you guys is a door. I close this door, which traps in all that heat. This is also a very warm environment in my house. This is one of the warmest locations in my house, if you can believe that. Um, so what I would suggest <clears throat> is getting yourself a, a thermometer. And I just turned on these lights. I didn't close the door. But it says right here it's 73 degrees and I guarantee you since I've been in here, it's getting warmer. I'm actually starting to sweat. We have 30% humidity. You need a temperature gauge, okay? You can get one of these for five, 10 bucks on Amazon. This is extremely important. So don't forget about this. You're spending all this money on your cuttings and all that. This is probably the most important thing you can get uh, other than checking the, the soil temperature and making sure, or the soil moisture, making sure the moisture is correct. So play around with this and, and move this around your house. Figure out where the warmer places are. The humidity here doesn't matter. And I'll tell you that why and why in a second here, but the humidity I'd actually, I'd actually prefer to be low. And the reason for that is because when these things leaf out, um, they're gonna leaf out into a low humidity environment, which is gonna make it easier when I move these plants outside. Because if I move these plants outside and they're used to 60% humidity, it's not gonna be 60% humidity outside. They're gonna get shocked, not just by the sun, the, ch the wind, the changing conditions, but also the humidity difference. The humidity difference is huge. So we wanna start them off in the lowest humidity environment we possibly can. What we are gonna be doing here, and I'll show you guys this now, 
This is also extremely important. And a lot of you guys, for whatever reason, watch my videos and then don't do one of the steps that I'm talking about here. And then I see you guys post on our figs or I see you guys talk about this process um, on my YouTube channel, comments, emails, private messages, whatever it is. And then I just shake my head and say, why didn't you guys just listen to me? You need to use parafilm, okay? Parafilm is so extremely important to your success that I can't, I really can't stress it enough, okay? Some of you guys may be so savvy out there that you got yourself a misting system. You got yourself like a, a professional greenhouse setup with a mister in it. You can control the humidity exactly. It's on a timer. You know what? Good for you guys, but not everybody out here is like that. Not everyone has that luxury. What a lot of people do very foolishly is they decide to use a humidity dome. And I'm here to tell you that is the worst idea you could have. <laughs> you might as well throw your cuttings out, especially if you're, you're brand new to this and you haven't gone through this process before. Humidity domes, what ends up happening is we have a dome over top of this. We basically replicate a greenhouse by creating a humidity dome. We, we have a bin. Inside the bin are the, the fig cuttings that are rooting, and we cover the top of the bin with the lid, and that keeps in all that humidity. The humidity eventually gets to 100% or 99%, um, so much so that when these leaf out, as I mentioned before, they're now adapted to 99% humidity. They're not used to a lower humidity. So when you take off this lid and the humidity is then released, um, they start to wilt. And they start to wilt so much that most of them will die. Um, especially if you do it at the wrong time, you don't do it very slowly. You need to be a pro. You need to be very careful. You need to be very patient. These are qualities that many of us lack, including myself. So I don't really want to go through that. Why put myself through that extra step? <clears throat> we need to be simplifying things, guys. I've mentioned this in a number of videos, but pretty much anything we do in life, if we simplify it, we get better at it. Um, if it's an, a sport, if it's a certain technique, if it's something related to our jobs, simplification leads to improvement and growth. So that's what we're doing here. We're simplifying this. We're simplifying the process by just simply wrapping parafilm, and you can see how I did that, is I very easily, I'll show you guys another one here very closely. And I've got cuttings in here, by the way, of all different sizes, all different shapes. They all work, guys. I have, I have news for you, but look, we stretch this out, not enough to break it, but we stretch and then we wrap. We stretch and then we wrap. Stretch, wrap. And we go all the way up to cutting. We cover every single part of the cutting, this is a half inch thickness, half inch width on the parafilm. You can use a full inch if you want. It depends on your preferences. I go with a certain brand, a particular brand that has worked for me. People are reporting that there's some fake and poor parafilm out there that are giving them trouble. I don't know if that's true, to be honest with you, but that's what people are reporting. I have something to tell you guys is that if you're using the parafilm that I'm using, you're not going to have any issues. Parafilm essentially, in a nutshell, is wax. And it is a, <clears throat> it pretty much keeps in all that humidity. I think that's probably the best way to explain it. So by wrapping it with this wax that degrades 
and also it can break with sunlight. Um, over time, it's just going to break naturally because the cutting is going to expand. Um, it's also very easily just degradable in the soil. It breaks down very easily, et cetera, et cetera. It's one of the best materials that you can use for trapping in that humidity. What a lot of people use is painter's glue, um, or they use a humidity dome, or something to that effect. Painter's glue may be sort of not the best idea. But uh, the point is, is that from this portion here, wherever we've wrapped this, you know, this entire length of this cutting, this is not going to dry out now. All that humidity is now being trapped in this as if we had kept it in this bag. And this bag, by wrapping it in a layer of plastic, is keeping in all that humidity. We're, we're basically creating a humidity dome. But now, here's the difference, is that when this leafs out, when these buds break, they're gonna leaf out into this low humidity environment and they're going to be immediately adjusted to that low humidity. So we're not going to have any issues. We're going to be pretty much solid just by doing this. And these rolls really are not that expensive. I promise you, you can get yourself six rolls for like 20 bucks. And six rolls will last you almost a lifetime. Uh, not, that's not true, but <laughs> it'll last you a long time. Um, so, and you know what? Parafilm has a ton of uses besides just rooting. What about grafting? It also can act as an anti-desiccant. Uh, if you have fruit trees, you're an orchardist, you are involved with trees or fruiting plants, plants in any way, uh, I don't understand why you don't have parafilm. I'm sorry. Um, so, that's my big long spiel on the parafilm and why that's important. What we've been doing for the last, I want to just give you guys a better view here. But what we've been doing for the last bit in the fridge, these guys, all these cuttings have been hanging out in the fridge. And what we've done is very simply, and it's tough to see on this guys, but let's see if we can focus this. What I'm trying to show you guys is the bottom end here is calloused up. And because this bottom end is calloused up, it's been it's pretty much been sitting in our fridge for well, I've made these cuts sometime in uh, late November, early December. So they've been in the fridge for about a month, which means when we make a fresh cut, I don't have my pruning shears here, unfortunately. But when we make a fresh cut, we get a nice green cut. We can see the cambium. We can see that the cambium is alive. We can see it's healthy. What I like to do, and a lot of people like to do, is come in here and we like to score the bark, is that we come in here with a knife and we basically just take off a piece of the bark off the bottom here. And we've got ourselves the cambium exposed. And now this particular cutting um, has a chance to root here in this particular spot. And it actually will send out a lot of roots in this particular spot. If you were to evaluate and kind of look at these cuttings, you were to bare root them, you'd actually realize that this has a pretty good chance. And often it puts out a lot of roots in this location. But also it puts a lot of roots out at the bottom because we've calloused up already we're beginning that rooting process. We need these things to callus up before roots can form. If we make a fresh cut, it's no longer calloused. Therefore, we have to wait. There's a delay for that new cut to then callus up to then form roots. So what I'm doing here, and I think this is, it makes more sense to me in my mind. And maybe you don't have to do, you don't really have to do this, but this is my personal preference is that the bottom cut, let's leave it. Let's make a new cut here when we score the bark. And then we stick this in soil and we've got ourselves a successful cutting that way. Because now we have 
the new wood, the new cambium that's exposed that has a chance to root there. But we also have a chance to get some roots where the callus has been formed. Um, so I think it's a double whammy effect. We can kind of get, if one fails, the other one succeeds, right? It's a little bit of insurance. We also get roots here at each individual node. At every node, roots can form. We can also get a new branch. Um, however, usually, excuse me guys, higher up on the tree, we're gonna have that, that new branch forming. So all I'm doing now, after I've made this score here at the bottom, and I've wrapped the top with parafilm, I'm sticking it in the soil. I'll put the, I'll pat the soil down nice and neat, so simply so that the contact between the soil and the cutting is good. You can water it in now if you want, but I highly recommend that everything is watered in before you get to this step. And that's really key. Water the soil outside. Make sure the soil is already wet, moist, excuse me, when it comes in here. Because when you, if you're trying to water these things in, it's going to be very difficult to get the right soil moisture. So pay attention to that. I think that's a really big tip that's overlooked. And we're going to do the same thing with this cutting. We're going to come in here, but we could take off something off the bottom here, or we could just take the back of our knife and kind of just scratch this up a little bit and expose the cambium this way or I could come in here and score the score the bark just going down a line here making nice little small cuts lines down the cutting if you guys can kind of make this out is that we're coming down here with the knife and making a cut like that. And it really depends what you guys like to do. I think this is a better way to do it. This is coming in here with the back of your knife. Maybe we'll do everything here. We'll check this out. And that is about it. That is the rooting process here, guys, in terms of getting this whole thing started. So we stick this in soil. And uh, by the way, the depth of which I like to stick this in is that I like to give, because these are nine inch pots, they're nine inches long, let's stick about maybe six inches underneath the soil. The bottom part here I think should remain, um, really should remain empty because usually the bottom two to three inches is pretty moist, it's pretty wet. It holds a lot of moisture. You may end up getting some rot down here and you may not get any rot on this portion of the, the soil. So I like to give them, give them a little bit of room off the bottom. Um, so basically what you'll do is you'll take, let's say six inches off the bottom of the cutting and then wrap the rest of it, wrap the top. Um, I will say the, the longer the cutting, the thicker the cutting, usually the more energy that is within the cutting. Um, the higher the cutting was on the tree, usually the more energy was in the cutting. So for me, I'm not really going for a particular size. I may say, all right, well, this cutting here, I could cut this one in half and I could stick two of these in here. But I, I really like my chances for this cutting to root. I think this particular cutting here has the best success or best chances of rooting because it's such a big cutting and has a lot of energy stored within. Yes, I could have myself another tree. Yes, I could even maybe do this with one node. Some people have, have showed in the past, but we're not good enough to do that, guys. We really are not. That's kind of a pipe dream. What I recommend is not getting too carried away and not trying to cut all these cuttings up into every small little piece you can think of. What you could do is save a portion of these for grafting and say, okay, well, this cutting here, we can cut off the bottom node here um, or the top node, save that for a graft, graft that in the spring, the rest of this we can root. You know, that's sort of up to you guys. Um, I've done that in the past for sure. I've done it all in the past and I've learned that without a doubt, 
getting the largest cutting is going to net you the highest success. It's also so not only are you guys going to have a higher success rate now, but when you have a bigger and thicker cutting, you're going to have an exponentially larger tree in the spring. And um, it's really going to pay off in dividends later on in the summer. When everything's said and done, it's kind of like, guys, if you you had yourself a, a seed and you're starting seeds, you want the largest seed, right? That's going to produce the biggest plant, the healthiest plant, get you off to the best start. It's the same thing with these cuttings, guys. It's, a, it's an exponential increase in the size and the success of these cuttings. Now, one of the things we didn't really mention is actually these tags. We have some vinyl blinds. You can get these at hardware stores very cheaply. We cut them into three by three strips, three inches. And then I have a pencil. You just write on here what the variety name is, stick this in the pot, and uh, you have yourself a tag. That actually can last for a very long time, about two years. Um, definitely a year. And I think they're affordable, they're easy to use. I really like using them. The alternative you can do is get yourself a paint pen. It's an oil-based pen that you can get at like a hardware store or an arts and crafts store. I also recommend using that paint pen to individually label every single cutting you have so that you can keep track of and not mess up the labeling process. So you can also label the side of the pot with the paint pen and that will last for a very long time actually, probably even longer than these tags. But this is what I have right now, and this is what I'm going to use. It's a nice little alternative. Um, so that's pretty much the process here, guys, of getting this whole thing going. Um, from pretty much the start of the season, getting the rooting process going. The end of the season we mentioned is really just simply getting these out of here after our last frost, hardening them off, and then uh, putting them outside. So I think that's really key right there. Um, we gave you guys a lot of information. The last thing I want to talk to you guys here about is the lights. And the lights are pretty simple. This is extremely important um, for getting these things going. We don't really need the lights just yet um, because there is no benefit for light to getting this rooting process going. Light doesn't really matter. What does matter is the heat that these lights are generating. So if we need some extra temperature, that's gonna really help this rooting process. The warmer the temperature, the more chance we have of rot. Um, also, the higher the temperature, the better chance we have of rooting our cutting. Sometimes cuttings kinda just sit there, and they won't budge, they won't do anything. And it's good to play around with the environment, play around with the soil moisture, play around with the temperature. You just need a little bit of a kick in the butt to get them going sometimes. So play around with this, play around with your lights. Maybe what I'd recommend is keep the temperature a bit lower, like 70 to 75 at the beginning when you've just stick them in the soil. Keep it a bit on the lower side. Once they start to leaf out, and they've got a lot of roots to them, then you can really start raising that temperature and getting those metabolisms really going. That's really when it matters the most. Um, but of course, some varieties may need a higher temperature than others. They may be more adapted to a certain uh, metabolic temperature than others. Um, and that just may be something you have to mess with. Um, now the lights themselves are pretty simple. You want to get yourself a four foot shop light here, guys. Um, it's definitely the cheapest and the best way that you can go here. Um, you can get some pretty expensive lighting systems on the internet, and those are pretty good for the, for the amount of power um, and the job that they do. Most of them work really, really well. Um, However, you can buy these pretty cheaply at Home Depot, these shop lights. You can even get the bulbs very cheaply. Um, I have over here some T8 bulbs. They're 4100K, and I can get a 12 pack of these bulbs for like 15 bucks at Home Depot. There's, they're 32 watts 
Um, what I like to recommend is the bulb is really important. The color temperature is really important in that, this is a fluorescence by the way. Um, you want to have the right color temperature because we're trying to mimic the sun the, the best we can. Nothing will mimic the sun exactly, but the, the sun emits a range of colors that we can't really see, um, but plants will absorb that light. And um, what you really want to do is get yourself a full range of them. So what a recommendation, a big recommendation is that you get something higher on the color temperature scale, something like 6,000, and then something low. And you combine those two together and you get the full range of colors that the sun can provide. It's not perfect. The alternative is doing what I'm doing here, and as I have a, a color temperature that's kind of right in the middle, that colors that covers all the different colors here, but it's not the strongest. It's not the most perfect. So that's really important, I think, is the color temperature often overlooked. LEDs versus fluorescence. The LEDs are obviously more efficient. The big difference here is the distance away from the plants. So the fluorescence need to be closer about four inches away. The LEDs can be further away. A foot, two feet, five feet. Depends. You're going to have to play around with it. Depends on the bulb. Um, depends on the duration. So the duration is kind of interesting in that you really are just looking for the most amount of light before you start burning the leaves. You'll see these leaves get some burnt spots on them. They'll turn a little bit brown or a little bit yellow. Um, that's not ideal. You don't want to be burning these leaves. That's also a sign that maybe the, the light is too close to the leaves. Um, the closer they are and the longer they're on for, the higher the chance that you're going to get these, these burn spots. Um, so it's a nice balancing act. I do about 16 hours with the lights on. They do need some sort of uh, darkness period, just like us. They have some sort of circadian rhythm they need to go to sleep for a time and not have any light. So don't mess with that and think you're gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna leave them on all night and it's gonna be the best cuttings and the best trees I've ever had. Well, you know, uh, it's probably not gonna work out that well for you guys. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the majority here, guys. We covered the heat, we covered the soil temperature, we covered the parafilm, and we covered these lights. Um, that's essentially it. Uh, the pretty big overwhelming majority of things that you guys are gonna struggle with. Sometimes these cuttings, when they start leafing out, are going to leaf out every which way, every direction you can think of. They're gonna have maybe five or six buds that are gonna leaf out. Just let them do their thing. Pick the most vigorous, healthy shoot in the spring. We'll cut out the rest of them. We'll keep them as a tree shape and you'll select the most healthy branch the most vigorous branch um, to remain as the tree's trunk uh, so that we can have them as a tree form. Or you can leave them as a bush, but only if you guys are planting them in, a in the ground in a colder location. Otherwise, everybody should be really growing them as a, as a tree. So don't really mess with them all that much. Don't bother them. Don't transplant them. That's another thing. The fig pot method. People love to do the fig pot method. This is technically called the direct potting method. It's, it's uh, in my opinion, superior because it's simplifying one simple process. Simplification, as we mentioned in other videos that we've done, is extremely important to success in life with any technique, whether it's sports, rooting fig cuttings, difficult tasks, whether it's your job, learning something new. Simplification always makes us better at what we do. Um, so if we can simplify this, we're ahead of the game. And we as humans love to complicate things, guys. I mean, I'm telling you, I, we could just stick these in soil outside and have an incredibly good success rate. We're not going to have fully rooted trees by May, but we're going to have uh, really good success that way. And by the end of the summer, we'll have a really big tree. Um, depending on how big your cutting was that you stuck in the ground. So, uh, 
one thing that the fig pot method complicates is up potting these these cuttings is that eventually the fig pot method you need to take the bag off and you need to transplant them into a larger pot actually this size pot into a one gallon size pot so by transplanting them we're giving them transplant shock we are potentially hurting the rooting process we're slowing it down we're really causing all kinds of mayhem that's just completely unnecessary um, if there's any points that you guys get out of this video is that you don't want to up pot your cuttings you want to use parafilm and you don't want to use a humidity dome those are the three major things i think the three major points I could get into the details of the fig pot method versus the direct potting method, but uh, the fig pot method has some superior things about it that are better than the direct potting method. I know a lot of you guys like to use it, but um, simplification, baby. Um, let's see here. There's one other thing I want to touch up with you guys before I let you guys go. Aphids. No. Fungus gnats, not aphids. <laughs> so fungus gnats love a moist soil. They love a wet soil, I'm sorry. They love an organic material that's wet that just sits here. These pots have really big holes at the bottom. So when I water, the water goes right through the pot down into this bin here. This bin catches all that water as well as some organic material. The water sits there and then encourages things like fungus gnats and the fungus gnats eventually proliferate. They go a little crazy. If you're on top of this in the beginning, whenever you start to see these fungus gnats, it's very simple. Just tap on the side of these pots when you're watering and you'll see little bugs flying around. They're black. If you see that, those are fungus gnats. Get on it. Get yourself a little container here that you're willing to throw out, you don't really care about. Fill it up halfway with water. The other half is apple cider vinegar or just a 50-50 solution of that. And then throw in some um, dishwashing soap and you'll have yourself the perfect trap for fungus gnats. If you do that right away, you really will decrease the numbers um, of fungus gnats. And people really fight with these things. They love to eat the roots of our cuttings they really mess with the whole process. You don't want them, especially when they're really high in number. If they're very low in number, it's not the biggest of deals, but it's still not ideal. Um, and almost inevitably, it's going to happen to you. Uh, but everything else is pretty standard, really. Just keeping the right temperature in here, um, keeping the soil moist. Um, raising this light up as we as our plants grow higher we want to have that right distance right and then that's it we bring them outside we uh, we harden them off and then we're good to go in the spring um, that's it guys so I want to thank everybody here for watching and if you're interested in more of these videos really in-depth information on this rooting process like I said we did a whole playlist on this very in-depth as we went along throughout that rooting process. Um, we detailed that all last winter. We made a playlist. Go back, check that out. Um, also, we do have some cuttings still available for sale on FigBid. For those of you guys who are interested in these trees, these cuttings I'm rooting right now will eventually be for sale in the spring. So if you're interested in trees, um, we'll have them available. Um, check out our blog, figboss.com. We're going to have information on there as we go through the rooting process on the blog. Also, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check us out there. And subscribe. I'm going to thank you guys for getting this far. I really hope you guys have a successful season. And uh, we'll do some updates, guys, along the way this year. Um, not entirely sure how many videos we'll do on this. But, uh, yeah. If you enjoyed this awesome thanks guys hope we'll see if we'll see you soon all right take care everyone